Hey everyone, welcome back, or if you're just joining us, welcome to KSSP Podcast. I'm Spencer. And I'm Katie. And in this episode of our series on the drug war, we're going to be kind of talking about housing and employment. So we'll just get started. If this drug war were to be effective, we would want to see policies implemented in the name of the drug war supporting the health and well-being of individuals, families, and communities. Well, let's kind of go over here. Instead, we end up seeing policies implemented such as drug testing, mandatory reporting, zero-tolerance policies, and coerced treatment that exacerbate harm in these very systems they are meant to help. Instead of helping those who may be suffering from drug addiction, as we would hope a said war on drugs would do, we instead see a prioritization and justification of drug prohibition, criminalization, and punishment. The focus being on the latter, we see negative effects and various social detriment determinants of health, such as housing, education, income, and employment. The social determinants of health are the conditions and the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. There are many different factors that can affect as the social determinants of health, one of those factors being the war on drugs. Yeah, in addition to that, just with drug testing specifically, just my personal experience, uh, drug testing is a kind of degrading experience. Uh, especially when someone has to watch you take the test. It's always uncomfortable for everybody involved and oftentimes it just feels unnecessary. Of course, there are cases where drug testing can be useful, such as in rehabilitation centers, which are typically abstinence-focused treatment. But there isn't any reason to bring the legal system or employment into the mix or housing or any of that. Um, if somebody is otherwise obeying the law or otherwise performing their job properly, drug use shouldn't be monitored by these systems, as it is an irrelevant factor when all other duties are being performed. And it's also just a waste of money to monitor drug use when the person is performing their job, otherwise following the law, etc. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And then there are also policies that have been implemented in the name of the drug war. So we're going to go over a couple of those here. Yeah, so beginning in the 1980s, employment-based drug testing became widespread. There's little evidence that these policies are effective in reducing drug use, improving workplace safety, or increasing productivity. Drug tests cannot specify how much of a drug was consumed. Well, at least the drug test the legal system uses. If you take a drug test in like a medical lab or something with a medical lab, then they can measure how much, it, you know, to an extent. They can measure how much is in your system. So whether the person is currently intoxicated or impaired, the drug tests don't measure that either. And they don't measure if they have a substance use disorder. Drug tests cannot indicate if a drug use will impact a person's ability to perform their work or if they present a safety risk. And among the report's findings are that it costs seventy-seven thousand dollars to find just one drug user by testing by drug testing all employees. So that's a lot of money just to find one person. And the drug the report drug testing, a bad investment, also criticized studies which claim drug users were costing businesses up to a hundred billion a year. So yeah, yeah that's, that's just a lot of money that goes to waste that you know like the government or business whoever's doing the drug testing, like the government or businesses, like they could be saving a lot of money by just not doing that. Yeah, especially if it does isn't it does not appear to be helpful, then it's just a waste of money. Definitely. Yeah. So then we're gonna talk also about housing and policies that have imp been implemented there. So the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988 prohibited public housing authorities, or PHAs, from allowing tenants to engage in drug-related activity on or near public housing premises as, uh, and deemed such activity grounds for immediate eviction. 
So let's go a little more into this here. Expanding on this, the Cranston Gonzalez National Affordable Housing Act of 1990 made it so that if a tenant's family member or guest, regardless of whether they live on site, engages in drug-related activity, the tenant and their household can be evicted. Included in that act was that evicted households were to be banned from public housing for a minimum of three years unless the tenant completed an agency-approved drug treatment program or had been rehabilitated successfully. Building on these, Congress passed the Housing Opportunity Program Extension Act six years later in 1966. This added one-strike laws and expanded on the previous acts to give PHAs the authority to evict tenants if they or a guest was suspected of using or selling drugs, even if it didn't occur on the premises. The policies above require neither a drug arrest nor proof that a tenant or their guest was involved in drug use, sales, or activity. Landlords are also able to certify their property as crime-free by taking a class. This allows them to implement crime prevention stipulations in their leases that allow for immediate eviction should a tenant, family member, or guest engage in criminal activity, again, regardless of if it is happening on the premises. Then, regardless of whether the alleged drug-related activity is illegal, landlords working with law enforcement invoke these laws by claiming to enforce crime-free ordinances. There have also been instances of landlords evicting tenants following an overdose. Yeah, so some states currently drug test their welfare recipients as well. Uh, this is both a waste of time and taxpayer money for everybody involved. Uh, some states only drug test those applicants who have a history of drug abuse or dependence, while others are randomly drug tested. For example, Florida tests all of its applicants, even if there is no history or even suspicion of drug use. But in Tennessee, only one person in the 800 who applied for welfare tested positive. In Florida, during the four months the state drug tested for drug use, only 2.6% of applicants tested positive. Meanwhile, Florida has an illegal drug use rate of 8%, so the average population uses drugs at a much higher rate than welfare recipients do. This makes sense because many on welfare can't afford to keep up a drug habit. Far fewer can than within the average population at the very least. So the drug testing cost taxpayers more money than it saved and was ruled unconstitutional last year. So what can we do to help fight this type of discrimination? Uh, because let's, I'm just going to make this clear here. Like addiction is a disease. It is a medical condition. I would say I would classify it as a medical condition. Um, so let's talk about solutions. So solutions for improving housing access include ending evictions and removing house bans based solely on drug related activity or suspected activity, restricting landlords from using criminal background checks to exclude prospective tenants and ending collaborations between housing complexes and law enforcement. Housing interventions that can improve the health of people who use drugs include investing in housing first programs and permanent supportive housing, providing eviction protection to people who call for help during an overdose emergency. Uh, so basically expanding 911 Good Samaritan laws and establishing overdose prevention centers. Now that we've discussed how ineffective the drug war has been, Let's discuss different policies and proposals that may be more effective at truly helping those suffering from substance abuse in our next episode. And as always, you can leave a comment below if you have any topic ideas that you want to hear us talk about in future episodes. You can reach out to us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. We also occasionally live stream on Twitch, so make sure to follow us there so you can be notified when we go live. And don't forget to like this video, follow or subscribe to our social media accounts so that, and then turn on notifications so that you get notified when any of our new content comes out. Otherwise, we will see everyone in the next video.